and just a little bit of introduction about myself. I'm currently working as a senior engineer at uh, American Express Global Business Travel. So from the name, you can see that we are mainly into uh, business travel. So we are business travel kind of a, a, a child company of Amex. Uh, it's, it's like a subsidiary. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, how we made orchestration in our project. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the project as well. How we made orchestration in our, in our project a little easy uh, with all my past experience with WSO2 ESB. And also how we how we deployed this entire infrastructure in in uh, Kubernetes in OpenShift, which is powered by Kubernetes again. Uh, so yeah, just to talk a little bit about our project. Uh, we we used WSO2 ESB for a project called Global Trip Record uh, in GBT. From the name, as I said, like you can see, we are more more uh, we are majorly into business travel. So we needed a platform in GBT where all the bookings that are made by American Express across the globe to be captured in one system. So some of the, some of the countries use uh, Amadeus as a GDS, as a global distribution system. Some countries use Sabre. Some have their own proprietary uh, third party markets. And let's say you have in, in uh, Europe, you have mainly silver, silver rail. Uh, so all, all these bookings that are made on global platforms across the world should come into one subsystem, so should come into one system in GBT and all the systems within GBT should be able to use that data from that from that system. So uh, to create such a big such a big platform, right? We'll we'll go to the numbers next. But to create such a big platform, we wanted a strong orchestration layer. Uh, and when I when I joined on this project, like in 2016, the first challenge I had was to to propose uh, WSO2 ESB as a better candidate compared to other, other products out there in the market in terms of cost, in terms of reliability, in, con in terms of support, in terms of uh, customization especially. Because no, no integration is easy. Uh, if you take any uh, proprietary software, uh, like I don't want to take names, but yeah, they don't let you change much, right? But with WSO2 ESB, just go download the source files, play with it. I, I, I myself, I'm a developer all my career, so I love to get my hands dirty with code every day. So yeah, um, uh, why why there was a need for uh, ESB and uh, orchestration layer? Because th there was an application before, even before our current project, uh, our current application. There was an application before, but it was a legacy application. It was in one uh, one Java application, which was like 100,000 lines of code across different files, and when you have to deploy something, you have to shut down the system for some time, deploy, make sure your tests are uh, working OK, and then start the traffic again, right? So we had to uh, go with a microservices approach. Obviously, 2016 was like the hot year for microservices. Everybody, even if I know something I don't know, it doesn't matter. I'll talk, talk about microservices, right? But microservices itself comes with uh, a lot of pros and cons, right? So the, the major cons being, how do, you, how do you orchestrate between these services? How do you go for service discovery? I could have 10 instances of one service running and five instances of other microservice running, especially in a Kubernetes environment. How do, you, how do you go with your service discovery? How do you do load balancing? How do you handle fault tolerance? How do you build all of, how do you build all, uh, build all of this into your orchestration layer, right? Um, and, and a lot of people talked uh, in, in microservices architecture, you should have smart endpoints and dumb pipes. I, I honestly don't agree with that. Um, when they say smart endpoints, smart endpoints only for business logic. Dumb pipes, the pipes should not worry about business logic, but the pipes should worry, should worry about your message flows, should worry about your transformations, should worry about your routing uh, requirements. Uh, and, and I believe it's it's... When you take this to management, uh, when you say, oh, whether you want me to stick to principles or whether you want my application to be running, I'm 100% certain that everybody will say, I want my application to be running. I, I don't care for the, we care for principles, but in the end, my application should work, right? So that's what, that's what we did with uh, uh, ESB here. Oh, I'm sorry. No? Okay. So, here is a high level architecture uh, we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of connecting systems and we wanted to enforce a single entry point into our application 
right? So we, we tailored that in such a way that everything connects to uh, ESB. And all the orchestration between the microservices happen within the ESB itself. We're not saying that a microservice A calls B, B calls C, C calls D. I saw in some of the presentations earlier yesterday, uh, we saw that service A calling B, service B calling C. But to me, uh, being a Java developer for 11 years, it's like one function calling the other. Uh, nothing different, right? If I have to change service C, I have to test service B, I have to test service A. And why do you need? Why do I need a microservice to do that? I can write all of that in three different functions in one program and be done with that. And when I, when I scale my service C, it can handle more load, but can, can my B handle it? Can my A handle it? So I, honestly, that uh, personally, that uh, to me is not, a, is not a proper microservices architecture. So, and, and trust me, this has been uh, a, a, a working model for two years with no issues. And we, we haven't had a, uh, downtime in, uh, in, in, a, in one instance, even in one instance in the last two years. So yeah, as you can see, we have different incoming channels. We have a lot of um, uh, FTP connections. We have MQ that's close to 2 million in a day. We have a lot of traffic comes through our APG layer, API gateway. And we also have a lot of legacy systems that connect to ESB. And all the orchestration happens within the ESB itself. We talk to different microservices. And we also talk to a lot of um, uh, a systems where we push the data out. Be it be Delbumi, APG, uh, we use Apache Kafka heavily uh, for, for all the, uh, to bring all the elasticity into the application. We don't want to overload ESB to connect to 30 different downstream vendors. The, the, Kafka, they, uh, the, the Kafka component you see there, it talks to 35 different external components after that. So we don't want to burden that, uh, in, that load into ESB. What if one of our partners is slow? We want to decouple that. We want to make that layer elastic. So put Kafka in between, right? So this uh, is like at the high level architecture. Now let's go to some numbers. So we, we process close to 2.8 million messages in a day. Uh, why, why I use the word messages instead of transactions, right? A lot of people say, oh, we, we process 1,000 TPS, 1,000 transactions per second. True, but what is the message size? What is the payload size, right? So I can have a hello world message, run it through a simple Java program, I can get 10,000 transactions per second. But try doing the same with a 100 KB message, with a 500 KB message. Then you will see the difference because when, when that message is going through your layer, your integration layer or your uh, middleware layer, be it with Java, C or anything, it has to create something in the memory first. It has to use some heap space, it has to use some CPU resource if you are doing any transformation say. Okay, uh, so yeah, that's the reason. I use 2.8 million messages because our message size is on average 100 KB. So take that, uh, if, you, if you put that in a text pad, it's close to 1,500 lines. 1,500 lines of XML getting passed, getting transformed, getting processed, right? So what is the next step? Every, uh, I may have shown only three microservices in my previous slide, but in our flow, every message goes through at least 30, 30 microservices. So we call service A, get the response, based on the response, construct the response for B, or maybe you, you may want to decide based on the response of B, you may want to decide whether to call C or not. There are some optional services, there are some mandatory, there are some services which gets, which gets called in parallel and then the response is aggregated. All of this heavy lifting uh, of the message transformation is handled by our ESP. And uh, during peak, so the travel being, uh, uh, a time sensitive uh, traffic, right? So it, during the day you get more traffic and during the night you don't get much, and you don't get much traffic on the weekends, but during peak hours we, we see uh, 60 messages per second on an average. And currently the uh, entire ESB is deployed as a, as a Docker container in uh, OpenShift. OpenShift is powered by Kubernetes. Even before that, uh, in 2016, we created some, uh, that, was my, that was my first task. I had to create a, a containerized version of WSO2 ESB, which can start in 15 seconds. Because when you are using Spring Boot for your microservices or Vertex for your uh, microservices, your boot up time is hardly three seconds, four seconds, right? And now I see more traffic to one of my service, I scale it up. Uh, that's the advantage you get when you go for any Kubernetes or Docker, Docker approach, right? So I scale up my microservice, I, I can now handle uh, 100 transactions, 100 messages per second 
with the capacity that I have in my microservice, but what about my ESB? I cannot go create another VM altogether and then put my ESB there, no. Th that was not an option for us. I had to do something to trim down the ESB, uh, make sure that it fits into Docker, it comes back, uh, it boots up in 15 seconds. So uh, I basically did what, what some folks were talking uh, about yesterday, uh, micro ESB, right? I, I pretty much did the same thing. It, but back in 2016, that was, that was when very good feeling that I had yesterday when I saw that. So essentially in, in uh, Docker, you get a lot of features inbuilt uh, into Docker, right? You don't have to, uh, let's say you don't want to worry about analytics, trim that part out, make, make your ESB lightweight. You don't want to uh, use solar, solar search uh, capability within that, remove that. You don't need that. So try to, try to eliminate all the steps in boot up, make sure it fits only to your needs so that it comes, back, uh, comes up faster. And um, uh, so some, some folks talked about using micro ESB along with uh, uh, microservices where services, services are calling each other. And uh, a lot of people called a ESB orchestrating between services as anti-pattern, right? But uh, uh, personally, I beg to differ. Uh, instead of doing that, what I have seen, at least in, in our project, let's say if you have 10 different flows, instead of putting 10 different flows into one project or one uh, ESB and scale it up, don't do that. That's, that's a very bad approach. Because any one flow running slow will bring down your entire middleware layer. Instead of that, create a simple Docker image for each flow with the ESB, I'll, I'll go to that step next time, how, how to package all of this in, in, in one flow. But instead of that, get one ESB per flow and try to scale that up, and you'll scale it, scale only based on your need. Let's say one of your flow may get uh, 100 million transactions in a day, but the other flow may get only 1,000 transactions in a day. So you should have the capability to scale based on need, based on the flow, based on the requirement, based on the traffic of, the, uh, of that hour in the day instead of putting everything into one and then say, oh, my, my middleware layer, uh, my, my ESB is orchestration layer. <clears throat> instead of saying that, better, better try to split the flow, split the deployment model. Currently, we are on ESB 5, and, uh, but we are upgrading to EI 6.2. Um, I'm in the process of uh, uh, removing the fat from 6.2. So the same, the same exercise I did with uh, ESB 5. So let's go to the deployment model, very, very standard. Uh, all the code gets checked into Git. Uh, then we have a Jenkins where the build is triggered, Sonar Cube where all the vulnerabilities and code coverage, bugs, etc., et are verified. And in Jenkins, what we do is I created a, uh, a simple, plain, vanilla version of WSO2 ESB Docker image uh, in 2016, Feb or so. So during our process, we go get that image, the vanilla image and then put the custom files into that. Let's say I, would, I want to use uh, 500 Synapse worker threads instead of 400 that's given uh, by ESB as default. So once your vanilla image is fetched into your Docker, then copy your customizations. And then all, all the uh, car files that are created gets copied into our target folder. And all of this is packaged into one final image, which is built from the vanilla image, and then gets pushed into our uh, Nexus repository. And then a build, uh, a deployment is triggered into OpenShift. OpenShift will uh, only get the image tag number. OpenShift will go fetch it from uh, Nexus again and uh, deploy it in uh, OpenShift. And, and, and it's like ready to serve the request. So one, one important piece uh, that we did a little bit different uh, compared to industry standard here is we, we don't have a governance registry. So I was, I was, uh, I was limited to number of instances that I can use, number of different technologies uh, I can use. So how do I solve for different environments with just the ESB? I don't have a governance registry, so I cannot say I have a dev test and prod governance registry where my ESB can connect to. I don't have that uh, privilege. I didn't have that privilege. So a custom solution that we came up with was to use another ESB project which acts as my registry. So I don't have the opportunity to show here, but it's a, it's a pretty good model. It is, it is working for the last two years. So we have a dev registry car file that we, that we create, test registry car file that we create, production registry car file that we create. The car file gets 
uh, added into the image as part of the build process based on the image, uh, based on the environment I'm building for. In, in Jenkins, we control that with environment variables. Let's say if I say dev, the dev car file gets copied into my image. If I say test, the test car file co gets copied into my image. The WSO2 image is plain, and I add customizations on top of that, and then we add the car files, and one of the car files is our environment. So instead of saying, oh, I, I refer the endpoint in a governance registry, I refer it to my local registry, which is already present in my, uh, in my, car, uh, in my ESB instance when it comes up. Uh, 